weeks where I was putting content out like once a week to help parents mm-hmm. with attitude mindset, get your kids to listen. And well, well, people complain because you put too much in. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, I didn't, somehow I didn't get the live. Let me just make sure that in my live, let's take a look. There we go. Oh. Boom. Yay. I just got the live. Let me drop Good morning, that. everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Live Coffee Talk Show. I'm Michelle Quay. I'm a confidence and leadership coach, and I work with people who have a lot of internal narratives. And we all know that internal narrative, what that sounds like. Um, today, I, it's my pleasure to have my special guest, uh, Jeremy Rodrug. He is a Kung Fu master, first of all. And his life has been very adventurous. Just to name a few things about him, um, he went through, he filed bankruptcy. He went through and almost died from a lung collapse due to a pneumonia. <laughs> and he also lived out of a tent for work. So Jeremy is actually very prepared for pandemic <laughs> to the topic what we're gonna be talking about. Today, he's a speaker, he's best-selling author, Kung Fu master, Pan American champion, former members of the military, by the way, happy Veterans Day for all the soldiers. He's also a former corporate wage slave, a former factory worker, husband, father, teacher, consultant, and many, 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 many more. So I am, it's my pleasure to bring him and invite him today to our show because the topic that we're going to be talking about affect you and I every single day since uh, March 2020. And it is a topic that I believe is actually a little late to talk about right now. Well, hopefully not. Um, it's pandemic parenting. So are you currently breaking down by, from your kid or are you breaking through? So without further ado, I'd like to invite my guest, Jeremy, to the show. Welcome, Jeremy. Well, Michelle, I am very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. And I, I, I honestly hope that we are late to the conversation and we don't need to do a lot of pandemic parenting because it's going to be over and done here soon. I would love that to be the case. But then there's people saying, what if 2020 is a warm up for the next decade? And then I kind of look at them and like, shut up. Don't don't put that out there. What are you doing? <laughs> and, and you know, that's a really good point, because I think when when pandemic hits and back if we were to think back in March, um, initially it was uh, the initial lockdown, a lot of kids, no more school, and parents are thinking, you know, this is going to be over soon, right? Three months, a month, you know, I can deal with this. I can just suck it up and I can deal with this. Mm-hmm. But later they found out that's not the case. Mm-mm. No, it hasn't been just a little, oh, it's going to be a blip in a couple of weeks. Okay, uh, a month. Okay, uh, two months. Okay, four months. Uh, and, and now they're like, hey, guys, gear up because we're getting into winter and people are going to be in the houses more. And so we run the risk of bigger, more exposure. Adventures. It's going to be literally, it's just, it's going to be a roller coaster. And, you know, we have technology, which is great. Um, but we have to use it and we have to get ahead of things versus be in reaction because, you know, you wait till the kid makes a mistake and then, oh, how am I going to handle this? It's usually not a great idea. And so, you know, there's still people, unfortunately, losing their lives to this disease and the impact and, you know, we got to do the best that we can. And it's a, it's a balancing act, right? And balance being dynamic like surfing right it's not balance and you i have balance now and i shall never lose it for the rest of my existence no it's a daily thing it's an hourly thing it's a moment by moment thing and so i'm excited to to really dig in on this conversation and just see what we can do to put resources out there yeah so so i know you're a parent yourself what what was it like to go through that journey when when we first locked down or you stay at home what was it like for you um, for us, uh, my wife was doing, um, she had an online business where she was helping virtual assistants to, to grow their business. And with our daughter being home all the time, it was like, she really didn't have the bandwidth. Um, and so she pulled back and closed that, uh, that, that avenue. And really we circled the wagons for a couple of months. And that actually wasn't too difficult for us because my daughter, uh, Miss Evie, 
she showed up 14 weeks early and she was one pound, 1.8 ounces. And she spent 13 weeks in the NICU. And then she spent eight months on oxygen when she came home. And so for about the first year, year and a half of her life, we really didn't go anywhere or do a whole lot of stuff. We kind of just stayed close to home, a little bit of family stuff. Um, but by and large, we stayed away from social stuff and things like that. So we've kind of practiced the skill already. And, you know, what was the, what were the mission essential things? I have a military background. I grew up in a military family. So it's like, okay, what's mission critical? What's mission essential? Let's make sure we have that physical, mental, emotional. And so, you know, then it was the, the governor of Ohio ordered my business closed the uh, 16th of, of March and we were closed until June 1st. So that, you know, did a lot of damage financially and, and pulled back a bunch of stuff. And it's like, okay, well, we had these plans for travel and plans for summer and plans for, okay, all that stuff's on hold. And we're just going to focus on the day to day, making sure that we find moments of joy, find moments of happiness and create those with each other. Um, get out of the house, go play in the backyard, go for a walk, um, watch the social distance. Like those are the important things. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we handled it pretty well. Um, being careful how much news we consumed and how much doom and gloom we allowed into our house, right? The, the idea that it's not the water around the ship that sinks it, it's the water that gets in. So the negativity can be around you, but if you can keep it out of your mental and emotional space, it's a lot healthier for you and for your kids. And for our daughter, I mean, she's just go with the flow and, hey, cool, I'm home now, awesome. You know, and she misses her friends and misses going to school and things like that. And now we've got her um, in Ohio Online Virtual Academy. So she's doing that. And we've got some play groups that we interact with strategically. Do what you got to do, you know? Yeah. So so I think, you know, for you you and your wife, you, you guys went through that journey early on. So you had that skills already uh, of how mm -hmm. to, you know, care for a child who's pretty much constantly at home. And it's more than just care for the child on a daily need. It's more about, you know, providing actually how, you know, life surviving um, um, support to the child. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For people who, I, I know a lot of my friends who are, working parents, their, their, you know, husband and wife are both have to leave the house to actually to work, to go to work. So for them, it's a struggle because now suddenly the kids at home, who's going to be watching the kid? Right. Right. And that's, it puts a lot of stress on both parents because like you said, you know, who's going to stay home and when are you going to stay home? And if we're both nine to fivers, how do we how do we do this? Do we have family members come over? Do we find like a babysitter who's going to move in or like a local college kid who, who can't go back to college and maybe they could stay with us? Um, does one of us give up our job? Do we uh, file for special permission to put our kids in daycare? Do we, you know, get with other parents and we like have every, all the kids go to one house and all the parents agree we're only going to do you know, 20 contacts. We're only going to have 20 people that we spend time with. And we just kind of narrow down our social circle. It's definitely a difficult situation. And the, the most important thing is communication, right? Not just here's where I'm at, but also like mentally, emotionally, here's what I need. Uh, Autumn definitely is much more of a social person I am than I am. I get a lot of interaction with people throughout the, the week and the month because of all the things I do. I don't have a need to get out of the house and go do stuff. I like kind of, all right, let's just be chill. But she needs to get out, like the same four walls all the time. It's like, it feels like a prison, I need to get out. So, so how do we create that stuff? And it really does require communication, which is a skill. And even owning your emotional reactions, say, look, I love you, I'm frustrated with the situation. And just, just let me kind of verbal diarrhea for a minute. Don't take anything personal that I'm about to say because it's not about you. It's just my own frustration. And then, <laughs> okay, thanks. I feel better now. I've, I've decompressed. Now, what I really want to say is, and then you have the actual conversation because just that that internal pressure building up and expectation and needs and, and un the unknowns, it's okay to feel that stuff, right? It's, but it's how do we manage that? And as a couple, as a team, as a united front, how do we go on the same page? Like that communication is just massively important. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the emotional and mental aspects of, you know, our personal life, you know, whether it, we're living with someone or we're by ourselves, th th this year really put it into a challenge. And I kind mm -hmm. of believe that, you know, a lot of things and trouble that we're seeing nowadays are really lessons that we haven't really learned. Um, how to handle. So we haven't learned how to handle our emotional, we haven't learned how to handle our emotional. And so there's all these challenges that keep showing up every single day, so that we can actually finally learn it. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, I know, um, this is part of what you do is helping struggling parents, mm -hmm. um, working parents to, to get them back on track to feel and relieve that stress. What are some of the some of the challenges that you have seen? Um, well, the better situation is you have two parents aligned with each other. One of the biggest things that I've seen is a lot of single parents, single moms, single dads, and the other person, the child is a battle. The COVID is a battle. You know, oh, well, we have to quarantine, so you can't get parenting time. And the courts have said, you can't do that. You have to allow, you have to allow parenting time. Well, no, it's across state lines. Well, no, I have a grandparent. Well, no, and playing this game to manipulate and, and force, you know, I want to punish you, you SOB, because I don't love you anymore. And you left me and I'm going to hurt you. And the child, the child's the one that suffers, right? Because the adults are taking stuff out. So I see that as a huge issue. And then for the kids, a lot of it, the parents are freaking out. The parents are unstable. So the kids look at the parents and go, oh, well, if you're panicked, then I should be panicked, right? Because nothing has meaning except the meaning you give it. So like you said, with the pandemic, is this really all oh, the world's in such a horrible place or is it just highlighting points of stress and points of miscommunication, points of expectation where you know we, we could shore up a little bit in our mental and emotional life. Right now, Autumn is going through our house and she's like downsizing and purging and like, we don't need all this, we don't need all that. And she's going through layer by layer in various rooms and just cleaning things out and going, man, our, our house feels lighter. It's quicker to clean the kitchen because there's less crap in there. You know, what, what do we really need? Do we need a, you know, a set of China that we never use, that's on display, that's only there for once a year? Like, do we really need that out or can we put that away and put that in the attic or the, or the basement or somewhere? So it's, it's really a great opportunity if you engage with it to look at your life and go, well, why am I living with X or Y or Z physically, mentally, emotionally? Why do we have these possessions? Do I need this stuff? And, and you, there's a bunch of stuff you could free up. You could just let it go and not even fill it back in, just enjoy the openness. Mm -hmm. And so it's really that opportunity to choose to engage or you can and, you know, numb yourself, Netflix, alcohol, drugs, you can rail against the government on whichever side of the political spectrum you are on. You can find room to complain. You can complain about the healthcare system. I mean, if you're the type of person under pressure, you're just going to complain about stuff. This is a perfect opportunity for you. And your kids are watching you. And they're internalizing the way you're doing things because that's going to be how they do things. Is that the standard you want for the world? When, when our kids are running the world, what attitude do you want them to have? And are you showing them that now or not? Not to say that that's wrong if you're not, because you're allowed to feel what you feel. But it really is a question of what do you want to, how do you want to leave the world when you pass on? Because you're going to pass on. Do you want to leave it a little bit better than you found it? Or are you going to take before being taken and nerf everybody else as long as I got mine? Because those are going to lead to completely different lives for the world and the people around us after we're long gone. So that's some of the challenges I see is that existential, like, why are we here? What are we doing? And do you want to have that conversation? Or do you want to numb yourself? And, 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 or do you want to argue and fight and just be right? So, I mean, those are all different perspectives. And it's, I see it all because everything that's going on right now, it's the same thing when I teach martial arts, right? Under, under a life and death struggle, when you're fighting with somebody, whatever nature you have is amplified. It shows up more. You get punched and then do you collapse and take it personal? And, or do you go in or do you get angry and get sloppy and stupid? Do you get more decisive and more focused? Like this whole year has been a great revelation of where are you? How do you handle things? And do you like how you handle things? Because you can change. You're not locked. 
I, I love how you tied it in into martial art. One, one of the, one of the uh, fascinating things about martial art to me is that there, there, there's like a whole theory, life uh, theory of how we can actually handle our life and how do we live our life through the teaching of, of martial art. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in order to fight a fight, um, you actually don't fight it by forcing it. You fight it by um, taking taking a stand back, and sometimes you lean into the force from the opponent. Yeah, the, you're right. There's there's lots of ways to do it because you can you can crash into it and force it. That comes with consequences, right? And are you always going to be able to take a punch or a kick or a choke or a tackle? As you're in your 70s, 80s, 90s, do you really want to take a punch? So that's one strategy. And then, yeah, you could borrow their energy and you could do things with it. That's another strategy. Borrowing somebody else's energy, flowing into it and around it usually takes more time and skill to develop. And if I'm working with a five or a six-year-old, that may be challenging to teach them how to absorb, redirect, and reposition. It may be easier to teach them to crash first. And then once they get that, then we can change that energy over time. But for some kids, they're more intuitive. They, they, they don't want to crash. Cool. Then here's how to guide that energy. Here's how to influence that energy. So it really is the, the goal at the highest levels is what Bruce Lee said, you're an empty cup, right? Water can become the shape of whatever vessel. Put it in a cup, it becomes the cup. Put it in a pot, it becomes the pot. So you can become what you need in the moment without being stuck on it. So we don't, we don't want to create an attachment that only one way. You must always smash. Well, but maybe smashing is not always the right answer. If you're driving nails, Hulk smash good. If you're opening pickle jars, Hulk smash bad because now you got glass everywhere and pickle juice everywhere. So it's it's really about how do you in how do you get the mind, the body, the emotions, how do you get them all working together to produce a result under conflict? That's really the the deeper lesson about martial arts is is how under stress can you get to the ultimate goal, right? Physical dominance, that's like a really cool skill. It's super important because then you can survive. But once you have that, how can I engage with you mentally? And you might not like me, but at least I could change your mind. But at the highest levels, let's engage with each other, even in a life and death combat, and I could change your heart and then we could become friends and there's no more need for violence. That's the highest level, but to get there, mental and physical come first. It's very, very rare you're going to have somebody just run around with no training, no knowledge, no experience, and they're just changing the hearts of everybody all the time. I'm not saying it's impossible, it's just very rare. So we build the people up physically, then we build them up mentally, then we build them up emotionally. And now that's how the, the, the elevation of the person, because you're 50, 60 years old, and you're still running around like a 20 year old trying to prove yourself and force yourself on everyone and look at me and notice me and pay attention to me. What did you do for those 30, 40 years? Because you didn't learn anything. So yeah, that's, that's really the, the, that journey of, of as we grow from being a fighter to being a warrior to being a sage. Because that, that sage level, those are the people that are the coolest to hang out with because like your mindset and your attitude changes and shifts. Just hanging out with them, it, it rubs off on you. We call that Kung Fu life. And you start to just see how they live their life elevates you. And it's like, those are cool people to hang out with. Mm. And it sounds like a very cool parent to hang out with too. <laughs> well, that's my goal. I don't know that I'm there. I'll let my kids answer that, but that's what I'm working on. Yeah. So, so what, what uh, tips or, or recommendations do you have for people who are struggling right now? Like people are trying to get their kids to get up in the morning and just, you know, sit in front of a computer, which, you know, let's face it, not many kids like to sit in front of a computer for a very long time. Well, kids like to be on screens doing what they want to do, not what they have to do, kind of like their parents, right? <laughs> it's like, we'll spend hours on Netflix or Facebook or social media and do a thing, but now sit down and produce a report, sit down and research it. Uh, I have to do the what? Uh. Now, is that an adult or is that a kid? I don't know, both, right? So a couple of things, the, the number one thing, number one most important thing is breathe. Just Take five minutes, 10 minutes a day, five minutes. If you, if you don't have time, well, you should do five as a minimum. If you don't have time, then you got to do 10. 
But it's really just sit and breathe in for three seconds, out for three seconds, in for four, out for four, in for five, out for five, whatever number that makes you not gasping for breath. But just sit and breathe and feel the air moving in and out of your lungs. And as you do it, relax the tension in your shoulders, your neck, your belly, just soften for a minute. Give yourself the gift of five to 10 minutes of just relaxed. You're awake, you're not falling asleep, but you're just awake and you're just at peace, right? It allows you to access your rest and digest nervous system. It helps literally to calm you down. It changes your biochemistry. And as you do that, it allows you to go into your day a little bit more peaceful, a little bit more calm, a little bit more centered. Because when something happens and you tense up, other people, especially your kids, they feel that tension unconsciously. And they think it's their fault that you're upset. Even if you're stressed about your schedule or you have to get this done with work and you've got to produce this, that, and the other, they don't know the reasoning for your tension. They just feel it and they blame themselves. So first thing you can give to yourself and to others is just take five, 10 minutes, breathe, relax. Shoulders down, soften the tension in your body. And then the next step is we use it in, in the ancient Chinese martial arts. When we bow, we do the fist on one side, the palm on the other. And the fist, that represents the tiger. It represents the physical world, violence, action. I would call that behavior and games. It's the things you actually do to get energy. And you can motivate energy in positive ways and you can manipulate energy in negative ways, but we all need energy. If I can't provoke a rough, if I can't get a loving response, I will provoke a, a negative response because I need you to pay attention to me and I need you to validate me, right? I was working with a dad and he was really upset because his son at six years old is always attention seeking. He's always interrupting me and he always this, and dad had this big, huge story around that. And I offered him, I was like, that's interesting. Do you think he's, do you think he's seeking your attention or is it possible he wants to connect? And dad's eyes like paused and his eyes lit up for a second. He was like, that one word transformed the whole entire relationship because now all of a sudden, all of his son's behavior is not a negative pulling from me. It's a reaching out towards me. And dad's whole energy shifted because I, I never thought of that. Like instead of attention seeking, it's connection seeking. And so that's the dragon side, the palm. That's the wisdom. That is the invisible world. And I would call that, that's the story. And that's the justification, right? Because our stories create our games, right? The invisible drives the visible. The stories we tell create the behavioral patterns. So if your kid's behavior isn't great, as you begin to change the meaning of it, change the story of it, you can begin to influence that behavior. Are they, are they disrespectful or are they otherly focused? Because you've got your list of schedules and you expect tonality to be a certain way and they throw a different tone at you and you take that tone to mean some, something versus maybe that tone means they were processing in one way and I kind of pulled them out of it because like you've been busy and in the thing and someone comes up and taps you and you're like ah and you like yell at them and they're like oh my gosh you're like oh I'm sorry I didn't mean to yell at you I was just I was I was tunnel vision sorry so why can't our kids be given that compassion and that oh you were focused in and I interrupted you so I'm gonna ignore that tone be like hey here's what I need you to do can you make that happen and now your kids can begin to change things and so like those are the bedrock, right? Number one is breathe so that you can be centered and calm and relaxed. And then the next step up, and this is like the you know, ancient, ancient Chinese wisdom, ancient Asian wisdom, one becomes two. The one is you being centered. The two is now the games and the stories. And once we have the two, then we can begin to spread out and do a whole bunch more stuff. And I've got like a, a four stage communication thing and how you break down the way people talk to each other and feed things back. And I've got a whole, a whole series of training we can do off of that. But the, the most important, get control of your breathing and your tension, relax, and then start to pay attention to the games and the stories. What do people get really upset about and talk about a lot? Because that's the story. That's a hypnosis. That's a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that begins to drive behavior. So you master those two pieces. Life gets a whole lot easier for everybody, yourself and your kids and your spouse or wife or girlfriend or ex-wife or ex-husband or whatever you got. Mm -hmm. So is that helpful? 
Wow, that's very powerful, actually. <laughs> it's very powerful. And I, I truly believe a lot of things that's happening either within us and, and around us, they provide information. And what you said about the, uh, the dragon or the tiger, um, you know, it's really just providing information and how you interpret, how you perceive that information. It's entirely based on your wisdom, the level of consciousness, uh, how, what awareness that you have. And it comes from just keeping ourselves centered, keeping ourselves grounded. So I love what you have shared. And I also recently heard on the radio that a lot of our kids, you know, they don't know how to process adult emotion. And the example that they gave was talking about the elections. You know, the, the kids are spending a lot of time at home with their parents. And when their parents are agitated, aggravated about the election, what's going on with the election, without communicating to their kids, kids cannot process what is it that you are going through. So they perceive it as something very negative and they pick up on those negativity that we are mm -hmm. sending out to them. So, you know, what you have shared is just so needed for a lot of parents as they're processing their emotion, spending time at home. Yeah, well, even even that, just being able to tell your kids, well, there are, you know, with, with politics and, and the thing to understand and give to kids, politics is about power and control. And do we want, do we want the government to be in charge of everything? So big government means you got to have small citizens, and then um, big citizens mean you need a small government. And that's kind of the two sides. And rather than kind of force your opinions into your kids, if you can help them begin to understand the situation, like you're going to play a game, I'm going to teach you how to play the game. And what a lot of parents will do is they start with strategy and here's why you should be on this side and here's why you should be this, this, this. And the kids don't know the variables yet. So you're putting all this energy and injecting all this emotion into your kids. They don't know what's going on. So the, the model I use and I put it in my book is, is the way you build a game. First thing you got to have a space. You got to have the boundary, right? We're the board, right? Meet me on the court. Meet me in the field. Well, which field? Soccer field, baseball field, football field. Tennis court, racquetball court, you know, th th those labels don't mean anything until we define it. So we give you, give you a boundary. So space. Then we can talk about rules, which is the energy to, to control. Is this touch? Is this full contact? Is this light contact? Like what, what are the rules here? And then you go to time, which is how you score points. And that's how you know you're making progress in the game. And then on the bottom, you've got the style of play, which is unique to the individual. So we talk about food, right? Proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, minerals, enzymes. That's all the micronutrients, macronutrients. But then you have the style of cooking, style of cuisine. Because mm -hmm. every culture that produces wheat of some sort, you know, some sort of flowery thing, every culture that has that also has dumplings. But how they make their dumplings is completely different. For some cultures, dumplings is just the dough dropped in, in some sort of a liquid and it's cooked that way. And for others, it's stuffed and it has all this stuff in it. And, you know, Japanese dumplings, Chinese dumplings, Korean dumplings, massively different than Italian dumplings then, et cetera. And so it's that, that, that bottom part, that's when you begin to like tell your kids about, you know, here's the way we do things and why we do it that way. But you're first got to give them the guidelines, not, well, these idiots are doing this stupid thing because they're a bunch of morons. And it's like, hold on a second. Is that how you want your kids to introduce you to the topics? Like you ask them about a video game and they're like, oh, well, these stupid morons who are idiots and are doing this dumb, you know, do you want that energy reflected back at you? If not, then you gotta be careful how you're coaching them in the first place, right? How are you setting the boundaries and the standards? And so, you know, with my kids, we talk about, there, there's three things you don't talk about in polite society, which is money, politics, and religion. Mm -hmm. And the reason you don't is because people get very emotionally attached to how much money they make or don't, their religious faith or not, and the political power structures they, they follow or don't. And I would say to my kids, I would say ascribe, and I use big words in front of my kids so they get used to hearing those words. And ascribe just means like, you know, you connect to, you could say prescribe or you could say ascribe and this just kind of projected out. But this is a conversation that's going on. And, you know, from my point of view, there's some good points on both sides and there's some problems on both sides. And it's really about how do we find the both and that's going to serve the greatest amount of people versus in the U.S. politics currently with, with gerrymandering and redefining districts. A lot of our political stuff is pushed to the extremes because that's how you get reelected. 
even if that the extremes is not what's the best for the most Americans or most people, right? The truth is it's a bell curve. And most people are in that middle section and that's where we need to like look out for people and support people. And we shore up on the very, very bottom end. And then we got to keep an eye on kind of what's going on on the top end because every, every human group of anything, people will begin to stratify into certain levels of accomplishment. And the people on top are going to game the system for themselves because that's what they do. And it doesn't matter what activity it is, Mm -hmm. right? PhD scientists game the structures to keep them there and make it hard to get up there. Political people do it. Business people do it. It's just part of the human animal in a given population that people on the higher end try to protect being on the higher end. It's just nature of the beast. And we can make people wrong or we can put toggles and controls and stop gaps to make that as open and fair and equitable as possible. Just realize by and large, the people making those rules are up there, right? So like personally, I've always been a big fan of turn limits and like you can only be in so in, in, in a political thing for so long before you got to go get a real job because most of the political class are more like each other than they are like the rest of humanity. And that's across political systems, right? The leaders of the communist party, socialist governments, democratic governments, anything, the people on the top end tend to be more like each other than they do to the middle or the bottom. But the power is in the middle and the bottom because there's way, way, way more of us. So, you know, being able to have that conversation with your kids and even just talking about it, because I'm coming at it sideways, not here's what I believe and here's why it must be. Just here's the overall thing. It allows you to kind of disassociate, depersonalize. Because I think there's a reason people believe the things they believe. And if I could understand those reasons, then I could find a way to create a relationship and connect with them. And when people are seen, heard, felt, understood, appreciated, then it's easier to support them and they relax and they can actually listen to each other versus if they sit on their edges and they're yelling at each other about each other's meanings. And you said this, and that means this, never clarify it, just project it and throw it. How is that a healthy relationship to raise a child? to have a successful intimate relationship, to run a successful business, to run a successful campaign, like anything. You've got to understand people and connect to their needs. But there's a lot of power to be had in polarizing and driving hatred and driving control because of fear. And so, you know, I have a saying, oligarchs are going to oligarch. And that's what they do. People who want power, they don't care the political structure. They don't care the economic structure. They just want power. So now you have a choice be involved in that process and disrupt it through obviously legal means or, or whatever structures you need to do to get the tension of the powers that be. But the power is always in the people. It's not in the small little ruling class up over here somewhere. Mm-hmm. And so it's that being able to do that with your kids, it, it helps you articulate your own thought processes and why you believe what you believe. And you give your kids a solid foundation to stand on while leaving room for them to have their own thoughts and feelings because they're going to have their own thoughts and feelings. So we as adults, we have to guide that to help them know where the boundaries are and where the buffers are. But if you try to tell your kids what to think and believe, you're going to fail because eventually they're going to move out and they're going to be in the world and they're going to come up with their own ideas. So why not just prepare them now? Beautiful conversation. (laughs) Beautiful. It's very needed. And I, I think, you know, Kids are going to learn so much more than if we just give them the strategy. Here's the, here's the problem. Here's how to fix it. Go, go away. I think it's a lot more effective that way. I, I want to hear about your book. What's your book talk called? Oh, your best child ever is this game worth winning. The only parenting book with a money back guarantee right there on the back. Hold it closer to the camera so I can see. It was, uh, the light was glaring. <laughs> there we go. All right. Where can we find a copy? Uh, well, you could buy it on Amazon and I'll say thank you because, you know, I make like a couple of dollars off of that. It, it won't change my life, but it will definitely impact yours and your families. And like I said, it's the only parenting book with a money back guarantee. Um, you can also get it for free off my website um, at Jer- Jer- theparentingprogram.com. Um, I have it there as a PDF for free. Just give me an email and I'll you know, can download a copy right there because my goal really with this book, it, it, all kids play games and all kids tell stories. 
if you can help your kids play a better game, a game where they feel good and you feel good, the world wins. If you play a game where one person feels good, the other person feels bad, given enough time, that game will always fail, it will always collapse. Politics, geopolitics, political, religion, anything. If we don't, it's a win-win or no deal. Because if it's not a win-win, it's not sustainable. So how do we build that into our kids so that they begin to filter for that because then they're not going to allow relationships in their life that aren't win-win. They realize, hey, you're, you're trying to help me feel small, sad, and cold. Keyword, trying to help me feel small, sad, and cold, not make me feel small, sad, and cold. Because make me is language, what we call at effect. You're at the result of something or someone else. At cause, I get to choose how I feel. Thank you. Because it's choice. Attitudes, what you think, what you feel, what you do, you can control that with practice and awareness. And so helping the kids understand, I want to play a game. I want to win with you. And, and you can't win with everyone. Not everyone wants to win. Not everyone wants to win with you. And that's okay because it creates different music, right? If everybody all plays the same note, there's no harmony. So we got to have different sounds, different notes. And those create different frequencies of energy that sometimes they crash and sometimes they create beauty and sometimes they, they work together. You know, you and somebody else too close to each other, kind of like a uh, little bit of distance. Oh, hey, we can flow now. We can make music. Cool. So it's just that language to help the kids like notice that sensation. You know, I was raised Roman Catholic, seven deadly sins. There's deadly sins and venial sins or mortal sins and venial sins. And that all may be well and good, but try to teach that to a four-year-old. It's way too complicated. So Evie, take a deep breath, pause for a second. You're not listening. Look at mommy's face. Look at daddy's face. Listen to daddy's voice. Do you think I'm feeling warm, big and happy? Or am I moving towards small, sad and cold? Do you think if I feel small, sad and cold, am I gonna help you feel warm, big and happy? Or am I gonna help you feel small, sad and cold? And she begins to realize her actions and her impacts. Okay, so let's take five minutes, you're, you're four. So everybody, let's take four minutes and we're just gonna go calm down for a second and then we'll come back and we'll figure things out and we'll see if we can do things better. And so we call time out, right? You do that in sports, mm -hmm. team's overwhelmed, call time out. Let's re-strategize. Cool, do it in your family. I'm gonna, so my daughter, she's now six, but she can go like this and everybody gets five minutes and we pause and then we'll reconvene and we'll figure out and we can make things better. Because she might be in an emotional place where she can't get the words out or it's just she's going to dig herself in a bigger hole. So she can do this as a way to interrupt everything. But mom can do this. But dad can do this. But stepbrother can do this. Like all of us, we have that permission. We have that quote unquote power. I, I need everyone to calm for a second. Can we just pause? And everybody stops because we respect that boundary with each other and we play that game together. And so win, win or no deal, that becomes a foundation in your family because what's your goal? Is it to compete with your kids for your wife's attention or is it to cooperate with each other? You know, so it's, it's the more I help my teammates win together, everyone achieves more. That's the goal of a team. So let me amplify my wife and my kids and let my wife amplify me and my kids and let my kids amplify me and mom. We all just become more amazing and more capable and more confident and more everything. Cool. Let's play that game versus there's only so much time and there's only one tv or there's only one xbox and now we're we're fighting over scarcity with each other and we'll well no i want to do this you know what let's let mom have the tv let's you and me play legos on the floor while she watches her show and now i can get connection with the kids while mom gets to veg and we can just take that shift of that time and space with each other because it's i just i want to let you up the more i light up my family the more they have that to light me up win-win if i demand they make me feel good I don't know if they feel good first. You can't give what you don't have. So the whole point of this is how to get your kids, because your kids are going to play a game. They're going to manipulate you for energy or they're going to motivate you for energy. Which do you prefer? And you're going to do the same thing. So which do you prefer? And so that's why it's how to raise a stable, centered, respectful, self-disciplined, confident, self-motivated, self-directed, successful, wise, wealthy, safe, healthy, and happy child for the complete or not so complete beginner. The owner's manual. People say there's no owner's manual of children. I'm like, yeah, there is. I wrote it. The owner's manual of children for parents, grandparents, caregivers, guardians, teachers, and coaches of children of all ages. My grandmother passed away at 101 and a half and she was still playing games and she was still telling stories because that's just part of the human animal. It's what we do. 
So let's get ahead of that. Let's get on top of that. I love it. <laughs> I love how you describe this whole thing as a game. And this is something that we will keep playing, you know, whether it's 2020, 2021, you know, kids are not going to go anywhere. You're going to still have that relationship connection with your kids. So hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. that's the thing. You, you make your kids mad enough, they can quit. And, and unfortunately, I, I don't want to get dark here, but there's eight-year-olds committing suicide because they feel that there's no other way to live their lives except to end themselves. Right? A friend of mine did, a, did a, an interview last year talking about that. Like kids as young as eight are committing suicide. What the hell is going on? But that's someone who literally feels they have no resources. They can never win. I have pain today. I'll have pain tomorrow. Nothing I do matters. I don't want to play this game anymore. I quit. Right. And, and I've got I've got a, I've got a, a young a young person I'm working with and this young person has some scarcity and is, you know, under seven years old, knows if he if this person says, I want to hurt you, I want to hurt me, I don't want to live anymore. He knows all the adults in him are just going to go into panic mode because if they ignore that, that's bad. He, whether he understands what he's saying or not, he knows if he says certain words, he has a magic formula to manipulate energy. So if we try to suppress that, the more we feed energy into it, the more he's going to keep going sideways because he knows how to win versus, dude, that's not a great thing to say. Let's say it this way. Let's say this. Let's, so we begin to change it. And then we change his language and amp more energy. And when he uses stronger language that puts him back in control of his life, right? Is it really you don't want to live anymore or is it you want to play a game worth winning? Well, I want to win. Okay, cool. So where do you feel like you're not winning? Well, I want this. Okay, cool. Well, unfortunately, somebody else has that. So if you had it, would you want us to just come and take it from you? Well, no. Oh, okay. Well, if you had it and you were playing with it and, and somebody else wanted it, how could we help you to want to give it to them? Well, I would need 10 more minutes. Okay. So can they play with that for 10 more minutes and then you can have it? Yeah. All right, cool. High five, dude. Thanks for making a deal. Now, while we wait for those 10 minutes, let's you and me go do something else. And now what we've done is we've just, we've just given him a structure and we've given him more energy to be in alignment, to follow the social contract with the rest of us versus, no, you can't say stuff like that. Don't talk like that. Don't be like that. Right. And all of a sudden he's getting all this pressure because he got this huge, big reaction. He's like, oh, if I say that, I mean, he, he came in when he started working with him and he was swearing because he knows if he swears, all the adults panic. What a great way to control people. And I refuse to play that game. I'm like, dude, really? Better language. And I move on. I don't, I don't suppress it. I didn't tell him stop. I challenged him, better language. So when I swear, I say things like, mother, father. So my, my daughter's in preschool and she got frustrated with something. And she like put the crayons down. I was like, mother, father. And the teachers busted up laughing because she delivered it perfect. And it was just, but I was like, that's my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> You're, you're going to get frustrated and you're going to have these tools to say certain words to decompress internally. Great. Let's make it fun. Monkeys. Like when I'm really mad, I'll yell monkeys. Cause like, why not? Anybody can swear, make it interesting, make it funny. Cause it, it interrupts you and interrupts the people around you. Cause you can't quite take someone as seriously when they're swearing like that. What the farfic Nugan? <laughs> what, what? You have what's, a what's... lot of these words. <laughs> I go <laughs> shut. Yeah, shooty bop. Like my, my daughter, she'll say shooty bop. My wife says shiitake mushrooms. Oh, shiitake mushrooms. <laughs> right? But it's fun. And see your reaction. You're hearing it. You start to relax. And then if I say something and I'm mad, and then I say it to you and you relax and you begin to decompress, it makes it easier for me to decompress. Because human beings have mirror neurons and I see your human behavior and I cue socially off of what other people are doing. So as you decompress, I decompress. Win-win. And you're giving people ways to get out of intense emotional states and back into resourcefulness quicker, faster, easier. And the more you do it with awareness, the easier, faster, quicker it gets. A game worth winning. Yay. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for coming and sharing a lot of valuable insight. I know a lot of my viewers are going to love this episode and they're going to get so much out of it because a lot of them, you know, I hear this constantly. People are complaining, you know, my kids is throwing attention on me and this is what's going on. And, and people are getting frustrated and yeah. we're hoping that somehow this would just disappear and it would end. But the reality is it's not going to end. Mm -hmm. um, anytime soon. So 
thank you so much for sharing all this. Yeah, one and thing I would say is when someone says that they are frustrated, mm -hmm. offer them the reframe to replace the word frustrated with fascinated. I'm so fascinated with this. My life is just so fascinating right now. I'm so fascinated because I'm trying to do this with my business. I'm trying to do this and I'm just so fascinated. And as you say it, because it changes the emotional state, you can't frustrated has a certain physiology, a certain representation internally. And when you change the word fascinated, the tone doesn't match anymore. And you're, you're, it's like cooking, it's like making a cake and you switch the sugar and the salt, you change the cake. They're both white powders, but you change the cake. And so that same idea, it's like when you start saying fascinated instead of frustrated, I, I took frustrated out of my, out of my vocabulary, mm -hmm. other than in interviews, I don't use it. I, I say fascinated. I'm so fascinated with things right now. And my wife is, oh, why are you fascinated? And I'm like, well, I'm fascinated because this is what I'm focused on and this is what I want to produce and things aren't, and now she can begin to coach me and she can begin to ladder me and, and help me get to a different place. And it's like, that was really fun. You're brilliant. And I get to acknowledge her and express gratitude. And then she's like, I know. And I'm like, yeah, it's fun. We go back and forth like this. So fascinated versus frustrated, just change that one word and try it for a week and see what happens. It's I a love really the fun challenge. I <laughs> love the reframe. Yeah. Fascinated. That's my new word of the day for today. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, Jeremy. Can you tell us where to find you again? What's your website? Uh, so you guys can check me out on theparentingprogram.com, on youtube.com slash Kung Fu Guy Jeremy, all one word. Uh, I'm the only Jeremy Roderick on the internet, so easy to find there. And if you go on Facebook, Jeremy R. Dot the Kung Fu Guy, or just Jeremy Roderick. Um, and you'll find me. I'm not shy. I'm all over the place. And I've got a little bit of stuff here and there on, on Twitter, but I'm not really active. And Instagram, I was for a while, but I'm not now. So really, it's Facebook, YouTube. Um, those are the two big places to find me. And then podcasts, because I, I have mine. I paused back in March. And then I'm on a bunch of podcasts, because I, I, I love to, to share, because it's all about lighting people up. Mm -hmm. And I will have all these links in my episode notes so that it makes it easier for everyone to find you. Sweet. Thank you so much again for coming to the show. And thank you everyone for watching and joining, tuning in to Live Coffee Talk. This is a show where I bring you love, courage, and connection. And tune in again next week on Wednesday at 8 o'clock Pacific time. I will see everyone then. Bye, Jeremy. Bye, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you.